Good afternoon uh, and greetings to, to everyone on YouTube. This is uh, a new thing that we're uh, launching today. And I want to thank, of course, uh, Ian and uh, our wonderful uh, Ringway Church technology team for making this possible. Uh, happy Church Sabbath to everybody. team for making this possible. Uh, happy Church Sabbath to everybody. team for making this possible. <laughs> Uh, happy Sabbath to everybody. Well, I realized that I was uh, online on the uh, on another browser, but I think now the issue has been resolved, and my apologies for the echo. Um, but uh, we want to um, uh, to invite God this morning uh, for this. So let's just have a short word of prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to. Uh, invite you and the Holy Spirit to speak uh, through the speaker. Lord, may uh, it be your message and not my message, Lord. And please bless everyone that is watching right now or will be watching this. And may this be of encouragement uh, to many hearts today. We pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Imagine uh, yourself in an interview, giving an interview, or a job interview, I mean. Giving a job, I guess it's probably a common thing these days, in these unpredictable times, lockdown, pandemic, furlough, you name it. There's so many strange words that dominate our vocabulary these days, don't they? 2020, that's what it is. Now, job interviews uh, have a specific, I guess, context. We can put it like that. And um, there is a hiring manager in front of you. And, you know, basically everything is going well. They are smiling, whatever you're saying. It makes them happy. You notice very good. You notice chemistry. You notice body language. And uh, you crack some jokes, you get a bit more daring, you know, and you crack some jokes. They smile and they laugh and uh, everything is great. But then, you know, in the end, as they are still smiling and you're chuckling and you're probably imagining which room, which office you're going to take. <laughs> you're imagining your job, your uh, future um, holiday in Portugal or Canary Islands. You're imagining everything you're dreaming already. But in the end, as they are smiling, they ask you one last question. Tell us then, you know, this is just the last thing. How would you describe yourself? Succinctly, you know, very briefly. Oops. Suddenly, all that certainty dissolves into in a puff of confusion and Fear, you kind of you get stressed immediately because you didn't expect it. And the only words that you can think of is, oh my goodness, I'm unemployed, I'm, I need a job, I'm so stressed and I'm confused. Uh, and it completely kind of takes you uh, aback and turns you off. Now, it's interesting to say, to, to, to think of it this way, but how would you describe yourself in a very brief, concise manner? I like that word succinctly. You know, it's, uh, it's an interesting origin of it. Uh, and you can have a look at it later on at <laughs> uh, Oxford Dictionary. Uh, but basically, it's imagine, and I'm thinking, you know, some of you are saying, well, before you ask us, Pastor, why don't you start with yourself? And I, I say, fair enough. You know, Julian Castrati, succinctly. Now, Houston, we've got a problem. Now, you know why we've got the we've got a problem? Um, because there's suddenly two versions. There is suddenly, you know, uh, one version who I really feel that I am, and what I would probably say, in, generally speaking, in an interview, what or I would like to say, what I aspire to be. Now, Julian succinctly is, or my wife has told me, loud, 
but friendly, impatient, probably lacking in modesty, you know, but not humility. I'm saying modesty. And I guess sometimes a bit too assertive. Now, the other Julian, I would really like to see a better, better version of myself. But I want to put you a little bit uh, in, in uh, your minds in a different setting. I'm going to make you a little bit not uncomfortable. Uh, it's going to turn the chairs a little bit. What if you were the manager, the hiring manager, and you had to interview God? Right? God is looking for a job. He comes to you and you say, well, welcome, come in. <laughs> All right, God, please introduce yourself to us. How would you introduce yourself to us? Let's say you can use 10, 15 words. What would you say? Which words would God Say now that's very interesting, and I think that's kind of quite challenging, right? Um, now I would like to suggest you know, imagine now God is about to introduce Himself very briefly. There's a beautiful, beautiful passage in Scripture, and I want you to open your Bibles with me in Psalm 103. I've got the verse here in front of me in the screen, but uh, normally. You know, uh, I would, uh, you can open your Bibles. I love my Andrews University Bible here. But uh, I want to jump straight into that crucial verse. Uh, now, it says in verse 8, The Lord, Yahweh, is uh, I guess closest to the pronunciation of the, of the Lord in the Old Testament, He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Now, you know, I can tell you this, dear friends, that Psalm 103 is just one of those top, top psalms. It's actually been called and branded the Mount Everest of psalms. So <laughs> we know that uh, Mount Everest is the tallest point on this planet so you can imagine, I guess, the high regard that Psalm 103 has in, among scholars in Scripture. Uh, basically, there is countless references to this psalm. And could it be that it actually also echoes what God is succinctly? Now, uh, these words uh, are probably the most beautiful words in the Bible, right? <laughs> Depicting God. Uh, they describe who he really is. Or, to put it in a better way, um, in our context today, this, this afternoon, how God would interview, would share in a job interview when you are about to give him a job. But remember that job, that job is... CEO of your life. Now, um, the first thing that we notice right away, of course, are these four qualities or characteristics that are used to describe uh, God of Israel. Uh, not only is he merciful, he's also gracious. He's not only gracious, but he's slow to anger. Uh, or we can say it in a different way. He's patient. He's very patient with us. But not only that, he's also abounding in steadfast love. Merciful and gracious. Now, the word merciful from Hebrew, is uh, the, the original meaning is a feeling word. A word. It's like a feeling, the feeling that a mother has for a child. And I love that because we know God is beyond gender definition. It can be translated compassion, tender affection. It's the opposite of mean and harsh or indifferent. It's a feeling of deep affection or concern. So what's the first thing we notice about the Lord as he's giving his self-description uh, in a job interview? He's full of compassion, full of compassion toward you and me. Now, the word gracious uh, in Hebrew, again, is an 
action word. So we had feeling earlier. We have action. Now, the root means literally to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. Wow. So the Lord acts based on his compassion. Many think that actually, you know, the God of the Old Testament uh, is harsh and angry. Well, of course, there's a different God, right? It's claimed in the New Testament is kind and loving. Absolutely not true. The history of Israel, my dear friends, uh, in the Bible can be summed up in the word failure, not achieving success. You know, we have a situation where Abraham you know, he tried, he did very well, but in the end, he failed. Moses, by the end of his journey as a leader, he tried, but, you know, there was a sense of failure. David, as well, who was not allowed to build the temple of God in the end. There was uh, a failure in the end, just like Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. Yet the Lord responds with compassion and grace. And after hundreds of years... The Lord does judge Israel and he removes his presence from the temple and the nation. And uh, now in the darkest of years, back then, the prophet Isaiah would plead with the Lord to once again return. And he says, we have become like those, Isaiah 63, 19 uh, and onwards, he, we have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name, all that you would rend the heavens and come down. And in a response, in a very dramatic response, the Lord, full of compassion and grace, comes down in flesh and blood to rescue Israel in Jesus of Nazareth. The Lord returned to Israel. And throughout the life and ministry of Jesus, we see these echoes in this Psalm 103, verse 8. But Please, let's go back to, to the source. David in the psalm is echoing Moses. And that should take us back to Exodus chapter 34, where the Lord went. It was the first interview that the Lord gave to Moses and Israel. Uh, but when we look, go back to, to, to the character of Jesus, we have Jesus, for instance, early in the ministry, when a leper came to him. You know, we can think of an outcast, someone you don't want to talk or touch, imploring him and kneeling, you know, uh, in front of the lepers. He said to, to him, to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus says, moved, was moved with pity. The Greek word means to have the bowels yearn, you know, to be moved with compassion. That's what Jesus felt for this man. And Jesus acts accordingly. And, you know, our God, my dear friends, is, you know, compassionate. He's full of mercy. And uh, when I think of myself, you know, when I think about what God feels about me, I think of words like hypocritical or, you know, about me, right? Uh, God is disappointed, disappointing, right? Because he's probably disappointed at me and uh, probably not so sensitive. Now, how about you? How do you think God feels about you, honestly? And uh, probably time that we stop listening to ourselves rather than start listening to God. God says that he is full of compassion towards, towards us. And which moves us to, uh, which leads us to the, other, uh, to the other point. He is slow to anger, of course, you know, or patient. But we cannot escape that anger word. Uh, because some of us do struggle with the idea of a God who actually probably, you know, we think he gets angry, right? Some of uh, now, the thing, the, the truth is very different, you know, because there are extreme views. Some of us maybe picture God like a hippie who talks about inclusion all the time and free love, you know. But God does get angry, but he just doesn't get angry fast, you know. Probably doesn't get angry like I do in a, in a traffic jam or impatient, you know, or, or in a conversation sometimes. God is angry you know, because 
he loves. Love is not indifferent to evil, my dear friends. Love hates evil because evil is destructive. But the Bible says that God is angry at every form of evil. Now, I'm telling you, you know, how do you feel, you know, when there was a terrorist attack a few a couple of years ago and the Manchester Arena, the feeling that you and I have, let's not fool ourselves, was rage or anger, right? But God, you know, and we know that in the end there is a day of judgment coming up and uh, But that day for us should be a day of celebration because it's going to be a day where God will put things right. But he is so patient with us and he's so slow to anger. He's compassionate and gracious. He's full of patience uh, towards you and me. But he's also abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, uh, there is this... Hebrew word hesed, hesed, or and emet. I guess these are also difficult to translate into English, uh, especially hesed, because uh, uh, it's it's a number of notions that were that are involved. But the, I've heard of one cool translation. Uh, it says, "God loves you with a never stopping, in never giving up, unbreakable, forever love." It's kind of like an underground spring. It's like, I guess, the we can call it like the River Mercy. And it's very close uh, to us here in Disbury. Uh, it just flows and it flows. This steadfast love continually uh, spilling out towards us. Just love, love, love. Now, the other word, uh, emet, is translated faithfulness, but it literally means truth. Now, the idea is that the Lord is true and trustworthy, and we can take him at his word. He keeps his promises. What better, <laughs> what better candidate for a job, right? What better candidate to hire in our lives, dear friends, brothers and sisters? Now, we see God's faithfulness in the overarching story of the Bible. We talked again, right? We talked about failure earlier. The first human, well, Adam, he failed, and so God promised to bless and heal and save the world through Israel, but Israel also did not manage well and failed. So uh, not only Adam and Israel, you and me, we failed too. But God was and God is still faithful. Jesus is God in flesh and blood, and in Jesus, the Lord took this, our common failure, he took it upon himself. Uh, there was a fellow pastor, he says, Jesus uh, takes all our failure, mille uh, millennia of broken promises, and he drags it to the cross, absorbing it in his death, and then breaking its hold over humanity through resurrection. Now, the Apostle Paul would say, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, verse 8. Now, life in a fallen world, dear friends, is very hard for us. Now, not only are we in a fallen world, we are in a specific uh, history of this planet. We're experiencing a global pandemic. Yes, there is some promising news about some vaccine coming up, but it's never been like this. We are not, even church, the way... Uh, we are not able to meet together. Some of us are uh, have experienced, though, many injustices in life. Maybe there is some horrific evil done to you, an injustice. Some of us are struggling with sickness and with isolation. Some of us are losing our, our dear loved ones, you know, because of sickness, COVID, or other fatal sicknesses and diseases. Uh, some of us have children who are struggling some of us uh, are struggling uh, also alone with no children. Some of us are in between jobs. Some of us are lonely, very lonely. Some of us are depressed. Most of us are tempted to measure God's love by our circumstances. But I would just say take heart in this moment. The measure of God's love, my dear friends. Please look at it uh, in the context of the cross, of what he did. 
uh, for us. We heard uh, just the other week, I think, when Beryl talked about God being also, yes, not fair because he actually died uh, for us and he didn't deserve uh, to die. Now, God is full of steadfast love towards you and me. How do we know that, you know? He, the cross, is in evidence. We are loved and forgiven. That's an anchor for our uh, our soul in the midst of this storms, many, many storms in our lives today. Look to the cross, not the circumstances, as the measure of God's love and faithfulness to you. And look to the resurrection as the promise of a new life where all the sadness of this life will be Undone. Now, but let's go back to, to Psalm 103 and just see the verses right after verse 8. Uh, how does David express it? Uh, he says basically, uh, starting from verse 9, God, right, he will not always chide, nor he will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Think about it for a minute, dear friends. The goal of God's love, steadfast, loyal, true love, is not firstly expressed in making you feel good or making your and my dreams come true. It's fundamentally expressed in the gift of mercy, which grants forgiveness. And that's what David uh, experienced in his life, mercy and forgiveness. And that's what he, God wants us to experience. To David, David wants to remind the listener that God has worked mercifully and graciously, not simply in his life, but for everyone, all the people of Israel. In, in the passage. And yet he does point to that individual, Moses. And that's why we have focused uh, so far in those four characteristics of God. Uh, because uh, I believe it's a very, very strong clue. He points back to this passage in scripture, Exodus chapters 33 and 34. Now, uh, basically when we read uh, in uh, in starting from, uh, from 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 Exodus, he said to God, "Please show me your glory." Right <laughs> in verse eighteen, uh, chapter thirty-three. Now imagine, right? Imagine the interview, <laughs> the interview setting, and he said, uh, "I will make all my goodness." This is the Lord, right? I pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, this is verse 1, chapter 34, um, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Now, verse 4, Moses cut the tablets, uh, two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed, the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You know, it's just incredible. It's just that's how God interviews, he describes himself and shares who he is, what he is, briefly, succinctly. Now, what did you see familiar in this passage? Yes, this is the very place where, right, we have the description of God. Merciful, graceful, with full of grace, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. 
that's what God chooses to explain. You know, God could have just said, I am omnipotent, all powerful. I am omnipresent. I can do this. I can do that. No, he chooses to introduce himself very, very differently. And I think, dear friends, that is very significant. And a confirmation of just how significant, how essential this phrase is, it comes from the fact that this exact description is found seven times, you know, in the Old Testament in, in different uh, contexts and, and in different books. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, Psalm 86, 15, Psalm 103, our passage, Psalm 145, verse 8, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, that's an interesting context. You can read it later. Joel, uh, Prophet Joel 2, 13, and of course, Exodus 34, verse 6, the very first appearance. Uh, and if we split that phrase in half, right, we get these two phrases, and they appear, each of them, many in many, many countless of uh, verses throughout Scripture. God announced himself, uh, dear friends. He basically introduced himself. This is who God is, succinctly, in a brief, concise manner, in a few words. Now, moreover, you know, his love, talking about his steadfast love, because we probably covered the other first three a bit more. It's everlasting, he says, on those who fear him and his righteousness to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Do you see this? That Now there is a condition there. If we are to experience this everlasting love of God, it's a contract, isn't it? Again, the interview setting. We need to keep our part of the covenant to obey his commandments. And it's, isn't that what it says? Even in verse 14, you know, it tells us that the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So the expression of God's abundant and steadfast love is mercy, grace, and patience as a response to our sin, to our failure, dear friends. And it's perfectly fulfilled, as we said earlier, and manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. He alone, the Bible says, was consumed in the righteous fire of God's just wrath in our place. He alone saves. So what is our response? And I'm going to close with this, how do we respond to this wonderful description, self-description of God? God in front of us, applying for a job to be CEO of our lives. He has, again, uh, you know, David writes on, and I want to go back, uh, of course, respecting the Hebrew way of, of, of looking at the passage. Now we go back to the beginning, following the chiastic structure. And look at me at the come with me, you know, join me in as we read the first five verses. Psalm 103, from verse 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your mouth is renewed like the eagles. Now, this may sound uh, strange, but in light of David's words, in light of God's words through David, I should say, uh, when was the last time that you sat down? You sat yourself down, I mean, and you had a good talk. With your soul. It's a figure of speech, of course, as we our understanding of the word soul. When was the last time that you reflected? When was the last time I reflected? Now, and David is strongly encouraging us to do that right now. What should we say to our soul right now? Well, I would just say, you know, follow the example of David. Follow his tip. It's perhaps that we should say, dear friends, Bless the Lord of my soul. Listen, no matter what, never forget everything that God has done for you so far. Everything he has given you, everything he is to you. Perhaps some of you 
could say, bless the Lord, O my soul. And remember, say this to yourself, remember the depths of God's forgiveness for the heights of my sin. Perhaps some of you should say, bless the Lord, O my soul. And please remember the healing work that God has done and is doing in my life and in other people's lives and in my family. Perhaps some of you should say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Don't ever forget the grace of God that brought you up, brought me up from the deep, dark, desperate and deadly pit in which I and you were once imprisoned. Perhaps some of you should say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Please remember the love that crowns you and satisfies you, that is yours because of the grace of God in Jesus. And as you do that, my dear friends, and I join you, it probably it should drive us to that very act with which actually bookends this psalm. And, you know, and, and the end, and you notice in the end of the passage, um, uh, verses 19 to 22, um, we have a number of series, Bless the Lord, O my soul, along with all creation, along with all the things that God has dominion. And we should say, Bless the Lord. We should adore God. We should speak praises and glorify his name succinctly. Just a few words every day. Describe God to your soul. Describe God, my dear friends. Please remember how <laughs> he is, right? And join me now again uh, as we interview him for a job. I'm telling you, probably doesn't occur to some of you. But he is coming every day and he's knocking on that door, on the door of your hearts. And he says, hi, I am God. I'm looking for a job. I want to apply for a job. I want to be CEO of your life. And, you know, you will go through the interview, talk back to him and smile and cry and maybe be angry and show all the range of your emotions because it's exactly what he wants you to do, to share with him. But in the end, that question will come. And you please answer God. And please ask him, you know, so God, explain, describe yourself succinctly. And I can assure you this, my dear friends. He's, he will say, well, the good thing is I don't change. I'm consistent. And he says, I have been this way, I am this way, I will always be this way. Merciful, gracious, patient, slow to anger, and abounding uh, with steadfast love for you. And may God bless you and all of us together. And remember to always, always bless the Lord as you talk. To your soul and give thanks and praises for what he has done in our lives. May God bless you and uh, thank you again for joining us online. Before we pray, just want to alert all of you, dear friends, and uh, uh, that we have wonderful resources. I ask for you, of course, to, to join our uh, uh, Ringway uh, YouTube and Facebook presence online. You can find us on YouTube. Ringway SDA is our channel. And on YouTube, on Facebook, Ringway Adventist. And again, thanks again to the, to the team that made this possible. But let us pray together now and uh, give thanks to our God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. And we just want to talk, to take some time, Lord, and, and share and reflect Lord, and say, and join David in saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. We thank you for being consistent in our lives. And Lord, as we interview you, and we really desperately want to give you that job because you are the best at it. We want you and only you to be CEO, chief executive officer of our life. Lord, as we are interviewing you right now, we are assured that you are 
oh, wonderful God, you are gracious, you are merciful, you are patient with us and, and full of love and loyalty towards us. Thank you for introducing yourself so beautifully to us. We give you praises and thanks today. And especially uh, as you made, you took, you kept your word, Lord, and you sent your son, Jesus, to show us what love means and uh, how love came in flesh and blood. Thank you and uh, bless everyone uh, that is watching this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. God bless you.